Yeah. Okay, so our next speaker is Pietro Longhi, and he'll talk about aspects of a correspondence between quivers and knots. Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to contribute to this uh, really wonderful event. And today I'm going to talk about um, joint work that was actually done here in Uppsala together with Tobias Eckholm and Piotr Kucharski about aspects of the knot quiver correspondence. So the main goal of our work was uh, to understand the origins of a conjecture that connects two very different subjects. On one side, there is knot theory. On the other side, quiver representation theory. This conjecture came up a couple of years ago in work of Kucharski, Reinecke, Stozic, and Sukowski. And it is quite interesting, first of all, because it relates two beautiful subjects, both of which have deep connections to physics, but also because these two subjects are very different. So knot theory, on the one hand, uh, is the problem of studying embeddings of circles in three dimensions. You can uh, picture what the problem is in a very intuitive manner. On the other hand, quiver representation theory is much more abstract. Even the formulation of what the problem is requires some sophistication. So if someone tells you that two different subjects are related, you may suspect that this relation must be interesting. There must be some interesting story. And if you understand what the story is, it will teach you something, both about knots and about quivers. As we're going to see, this is the case. And in particular, uh, both knots and quivers have uh, a natural role in, in physics and string theory. And it turns out that this connection is indeed established by string theory as a sort of chain of dualities. And if you walk through this chain, you end up learning something new, not only about knots and quivers themselves, but also about other subjects that you encounter along the way, like open gram witten theory and the geometry of augmentation varieties. So let me start by reviewing some definitions of the basic objects that go into the correspondence and Let's start from the knot theory side. So the general philosophy of knot theory is to distinguish among different embeddings of circles in three spheres by assignment of some topological invariance. And a classical example of that is the humphrey pt polynomial. So you take a knot, you project it down on a plane, and then to define the humphrey pt polynomial, you can recursively apply the scan relations until you're left with many copies of the knot whose polynomial is defined to be this ratio. So that's a fairly simple definition. You can apply it to any knot. It's quite general. And for example, for the trefoil, you'll find this expression. So that's what we're going to need from knot theory. On the other side, we have quivers. So a quiver is an oriented graph with a set of nodes, Q0, connected by a number of arrows. And I'm going to package the number of arrows from node i to j into a matrix whose matrix element CIJ counts them. Given a quiver, you can define a notion of representation labeled by some dimension vector. This is a vector of integers, one for each node. And a representation is the assignment of a vector space to each node of dimension di, and the assignment of a linear map to each arrow connecting two nodes. Given a representation, you can introduce a notion of stability so you define a stability vector. This is a real vector with one entry for each node. You say a representation is stable if the dimension vector is orthogonal to the stability vector, and if for every proper subrepresentation, d prime of dimension d prime, uh, this inequality is satisfied. It's just some definition for what it means to be stable. But once you have this definition, you can go ahead and study entire moduli spaces of representations that satisfy this condition. And then the Betty numbers, perhaps virtual Betty numbers of these moduli spaces, are sometimes called the motivic nelson thomas invariants of the quiver. So these are some numbers labeled by the dimension vector and by uh, j, which is the degree of the Betty number. Now, in the context of the knot quiver correspondence, the quivers that are going to play a role have the property that there's an equal number of arrows from node i to j as there are in the opposite direction. These are called symmetric, and a beautiful fact 
about symmetric quivers is uh, the representation theory is completely under control, thanks to work of Efimov, who defines a partition function associated with a quiver. Yeah. So Efimov defines this partition function. It's defined as a sum over uh, all dimension vectors. It depends on certain uh, variables, xi. There's one variable for each node. And it is entirely determined by the structure of the matrix C, encoding the structure of the quiver. So this is a definition, but then how do you get motivic dons and Thomas invariants? You rewrite this as a product of all dimension vectors of cupo hammers, and then the exponents are the Betty numbers of quiver representation theory. And these are also guaranteed to be positive integers. So this is what we have on the quiver side. As you can see, the definition has a very different flavor from uh, scan relations for Humphrey polynomials. But nevertheless, uh, these people conjectured that for every knot, there is a corresponding quiver together with a set of integers, a i, q i, one for each node, such that if you take the partition function of quiver representations and you specialize the variables x i to this product of x a and q, then what you get is exactly the generating series of colored Humphrey PT polynomials for the knot. And for instance, for the trefoil knot, the corresponding quiver would have three nodes connected in this way. Okay? Now, in fact, this is only the most basic version of the knot quiver correspondence. There are more sophisticated statements uh, in the original paper involving refined knot invariants as well as knot homologies. And as far as uh, evidence goes, there's pretty convincing evidence, so they provide quivers for infinite families of torus knots, all families of twist knots, and later on there appeared a proof uh, for a class of links known as rational links. So evidence is fairly compelling to us. Uh, for today, I'm going to focus just on the basic version, so the equality of the partition function of quiver representations and the partition function of Humphrey PT polynomials. Although in our paper you can find some statements about uh, refinement and so on. But let's stick to this. Uh, one can ask several interesting questions already at this level. And the big question I will try to address to some extent is why does this work? Why is it the case that not invariants admit a description in terms of quivers? So more concretely you could ask, given a knot, how do I get the dual quiver? Or more conceptually you could ask, in the quiver I have nodes and arrows, what do they mean from the viewpoint of knot theory? And what is the meaning of these parameters a, i, and q, i, which are crucial for specializing the partition function of quiver representations to the Humphrey PT? So what do they mean? Also, is the correspondence one-to-one? -one? Is there a unique quiver for each knot and the other way around? So as I mentioned, the strategy to answer these questions will be to understand, first of all, in what context knots and quivers appear in string theory, and then see how string theory connects them. So let's start from the role of knots in physics. Uh, natural starting point is an observation due to Witten that Humphrey PT polynomials uh, can be computed at, as expectation values of Wilson lines in Chern Simon's theory on the three sphere with gauge group UN at level K. And there's this, this relation between N and K and the parameters in the scale relations. Another important observation also due to Witten is that Trans-Simon's theory without any insertion of Wilson loops on the three sphere is in fact equivalent to open topological strings on the cotangent of S3 with a stack of A brains on the zero section. And it was proposed by Gopakumar and Vafa that in the tooth limit of the gauge theory, there is a geometric transition on the string theory side where you replace cotangent of S3 with the resolved conifold and the toothed coupling determines the size of the P1. Then, to reintroduce knots in the picture, Uguri and Vafa consider the class of brains, uh, known as knot conormals. These are defined in T star S3, and the basic property of these brains is that they intersect the zero section uh, precisely along the knot, so the geometry of these brains carries information about K, and they also argue that these brains somehow should survive the geometric transition, 
and therefore they should transition to brains in the resolved conifal. Then they propose that the topological string partition function on the resolved conifal in presence of a not conormal brain indeed computes the generating series of homophily PT polynomials. So this will be the starting point for us. It's an excellent starting point because what appears on the right-hand side is exactly what we saw in the not quiver correspondence. But already at this point, we learned something new from going to topological strings. So we knew what A and Q were from the scan relations, and we know what they are in Chern Simon's theory. But topological strings also give a meaning to this new variable X. So X is a modulus that um, parameterizes configurations for the Lagrangian brain LK. The topology of not conormals is a solid torus. That means that they have one real deformation, R, that gets complexified by the holonomy of a U1 gauge field on the brain. And we're going to package everything into this exponential variable and call it the longitude. Then we want to study configurations of the brain. And so we're going to consider the phase space of flat connections on LK, which is the phase space of flat connections on its boundary. The boundary is a torus, so the phase space is a torus. It's easy to quantize tori. Uh, space is compact, so you get plane waves with quantized momentum um, in units of h-bar. And if you stare at these plane waves for a second, you realize that these are precisely the monomials x to the n that appear in the generating function of homophily PT polynomials. So you learn that, indeed, this partition function of homophily PT polynomials can be thought of as a wave function in the Hilbert space of flat connections on the boundary torus of LK. This is uh, not surprising if you're familiar with this construction. There's a similar interpretation for the topological string partition function. And so, given this equality between wave functions, you may ask, about the semi-classical limit. Now, in the semi-classical limit, topological strings, um, so the partition function is dominated by genus zero contributions. So these are encoded by the so-called Gromov-Witten disk potential. But on the other side, uh, in this uh, expansion in play waves, you have that the quantized momentum approaches a, continuous li a continuum limit as h bar goes to zero, so we replace n with some continuous variable y. The sum turns into an integral. x to the n gives this log x log y term. And the homophily PT polynomials give you a function, w tilde, that will be a function of this continuous variable y. Now, what is here on the right-hand side actually has a very natural interpretation from the viewpoint of a churn simons theory on the not conormal. So this term here is what remains of the Trinsimons functional after you fix gauge invariance. The integral is what remains of the path integral. And this function here can be interpreted as a potential uh, encoding certain sources that live on the brain and they're coupled, they're charged under the Trinsimons gauge field. So what does that mean? Well. Uh, Oguri and Wafa tell us that the topological string partition function is a discrete Fourier transform of homophily PT polynomials. In the semi-classical limit, this means that the spectrum of holomorphic disks encoded by the gram witten disk potential arises from the Legendre transform of a potential for some sources living on the brain and interacting with this uh, Trans-Simons gauge field. So, what are these sources? Well, of course, they arise from boundaries of holomorphic disks uh, that end on the not conormal. So here they are. And let's think for a moment about how they affect the geometry of flat connections on LK. So if you didn't have any disks, the meridian cycle, this green circle, would be contractible. So then you would say that the meridian holonomy, Y, would be trivial. But of course, with the sources, uh, this gets corrected, and it gets corrected to some uh, non-trivial relation between x and y, between the longitudinal and meridian holonomy, due to the presence of these sources. And this, this relation is encoded precisely by the saddle points of the, of the integral that you saw on the previous slide. So this is the saddle point equation. You can rewrite them equivalently in this form. These are just constraints arising from the Legendre transform. And what this equation is describing is those flat connections 
on the torus boundary that can be extended to flat connections in the bulk in presence of these Wilson lines. So therefore, these equations are nothing but the augmentation polynomial of, um, of the knot that gives rise to this conormal. And indeed, on the right-hand side here, you can recognize the familiar statement that the ground width in this potential arises from the Abel-Jacobi map on the augmentation curve. So, so far, I've just reviewed a little bit what is the connection between topological strings and knot invariants, and uh, I've sort of shifted the focus away from holomorphic disks and into what happens inside the not normal brain. Now, the next question I want to ask is, uh, given this picture uh, that arises in the semi-classical limit, and given the fact that the knot quiver correspondence tells us that the partition function of knot invariance is equal to the quiver partition function, what does it say, what is the semi-classical limit of this side of the correspondence? Can we define uh, some notion of semi-classical limit? So by analogy with what we've done before, for now let me just define some continuous variables where we trade the discrete summation over dimension vectors with some variables yi. There will be one for each uh, node in the quiver. And then this sum turns over to a multiple integral. Again, xi to the di gives me this transimus like terms, log xi log yi. And uh, these two terms, they will contribute some potential, um, some source potential, w tilde of q, that has the important property of being finite. So this is a very nice function in some sense, and you should think of each one of these dilogarithms as one for each node. You should think of each one of these as a source coupling to the trans connection. I'll, I'll clarify what that means in a moment. And this is in sharp contrast with what we would have got if we um, actually computed W tilde of LK in the partition function of Holmes-Lippy Flippity polynomials. The fact that W tilde of Q is finite is, is actually very important, and you will see why. So the physical interpretation of the semi-classical limit may be a bit obscure at this point, so let's try to clarify what that means. Let's take the saddle point equations for this multiple integral. These are some algebraic equations for uh, these variables xi and yi. There is one such equation for each node in the quiver. We call them the quiver A polynomials, by analogy with the way the augmentation curve appeared. And since in the knot quiver correspondence, you know that xi's are proportional to single power of x, it follows easily that the product of the yi variables must be y. But x and y, remember, were longitude and meridian on the boundary torus of the not conormal brain. And so you can take the first statement to mean that each source is winding once around the solid torus, and that yi is the contribution of each source to the meridian on the boundary. So if you take this solid torus, you cut a slice, you get a disk, and the sources are piercing this disk, and around each of the sources you have some meridian holonomy, which is yi, and if you sum them all up, you get the meridian at infinity. Okay, given this interpretation of what xi and yi are, then you can tell what is the meaning of the quiver matrix. This must be some linking numbers, because you see from this equation that the cij appear as corrections of xi by yj. And this happens because if you have a source, i, whose uh, longitude, uh, well, which winds around source j, then you see that its longitudinal holonomy gets shifted by yj with the power given by the linking number. So we learn that each node of the quiver can be thought of as a, fundamental, as a source in the Trans-Simons theory on the not normal brain, and that the quiver matrix is actually a matrix of linking numbers of these uh, sources. As I just said, xi and yi are holonomies on some tubular neighborhoods around these sources, and so we're now studying transimons or flat connections on a solid torus with many boundaries. That means we have an enlarged phase space with C star cross C star to the number of nodes. And this justifies the statement, well, the semi-classical limit that we took before. You can think of 
the quiver partition function as a wave function on the quantization of this larger phase space. Now we can also see what is the role of the quiver A polynomials. This, uh, these equations uh, that arise as saddle points, they define a Lagrangian submanifold in this larger phase space of middle dimension, and this corresponds to connections that can be extended from the boundary into the bulk in presence of these sources. And finally, the role of the not quiver change of variables is to further reduce uh, this Lagrangian submanifold to a one-dimensional subvariety that is the augmentation curve. So here we learn some, something uh, that's also a bit surprising. Uh, you learn that the augmentation curve, uh, in many cases, well, at least, at least in those cases for which the not quiver correspondence holds, it can be decomposed into some building blocks that take a universal form, and these are the quiver polynomials. Then by taking these building blocks, doing elimination of variables, and specializing, you get back this, this curve. And it's also interesting to notice that this is the first place where uh, the way the not conormal is embedded into the conifold starts to play a role. So, so far, we've just focused on what happens inside LK, but in this specialization, you have these variables AI, and these uh, encode how many times each basic disk, giving rise to uh, the sources that we've talked about, how many times the basic disk wraps the P1. So that's information about how LK is, is embedded, actually, in the conifold. So, in fact, let's go... Yep. That's a, that's a very good question. It's something we would like to know, but uh, we don't know at this point. Yeah. So if you, I guess, if you can show that that is the case, then you're probably very close to proving that there's a quiver behind that curve. But yeah, that would be very nice. Right, so let's, let's go back to holomorphic disks, uh, topological strings. So, so far we've focused on what happens in the trans Simon theory on K, as we've seen before, there is a source potential that encodes a certain number of sources, and is related by Lejeune transform to the gramov witten disk potential. And now what we've done is, through the not quiver correspondence, we've derived a dual description of the source potential. So if you take the Lejeune transform of that, you get some function of the Xi that we call the quiver disk potential. And we call it like that because if you just specialize these variables Xi, you recover the gramov witten disk potential. So what that means is that this quiver disk potential actually refines the usual count of holomorphic disks by the gramov witten disk potential. And quite concretely, the gramov witten disk potential is a sum of uh, dilogarithms. Each of these can be thought of as a holomorphic disk with some integral coefficients uh, that go by the name of LMOV invariants. In the case of the quiver disk potential, you have a similar sum, but the coefficients are um, this motivic Donaldson Thomas invariants uh, arising from quiver representation theory. And the difference between these two sums is in the grading. So here you have a more refined grading due to the dimension vector. And once you specialize these x variables back to x and a, you, you go back to the gromov witten disk potential. So, so far, we've seen that there is a quiver description for the spectrum of holomorphic curves. And this description includes, first of all, a finite set of basic disks. There is one disk for each node in the quiver. This change of variables is telling you that each disk is wrapping once around the knot, and this number of times around the P1 in the conifold. And the rest of the spectrum of holomorphic disks arises as table quiver representations labeled by some dimension vector that keeps track of how many copies of each basic disk there are in each bound state. The number of bound states is counted by the motivic DT invariance. And perhaps what's a bit surprising is that this whole spectrum is completely encoded just by the linking numbers of the boundaries of the basic disks. But that's not all. The real bonus is that this does not stop to genus zero the partition function of quiver representation theory is equal to the topological string partition function at finite Q, and what that 
uh, suggests is that even higher genus curves are um, computed from bound states. They arise as bound states of basic disks. Uh, and somehow, everything just depends on how the boundaries of these disks link together. And the mechanism by which these bound states are all generated uh, is all encoded into some quiver dynamics. So, so far, I've just taken the not quiver correspondence and explored some consequences, taken that for granted, and we've seen, so we, we arrive at this picture. Now, let me go back to the uh, original question, which is why does this work? And given what we learned, what is the origin of these quiver dynamics? So to answer this question, well, to some extent, um, it helps to uh, switch from topological strings to M-theory. The relevant setup is to take the conifold times a circle times R4 with the five brain wrapping the not normal times as one times a plane. And then the world sheet instantons get lifted to M2 brains on holomorphic curves times as one. And given this setup, you can go back to topological strings, or you can ask what happens in the extra directions on space-time. In particular, the five-brain wrapping a three-manifold is well known to engineer a 3D n equal two theory that uh, is known as T of LK. It lives on S1 times R2. And uh, the Mofte, Gukov, and Hollands argued that the vortex partition function of T of LK is in fact uh, the same as the open topological string partition function on the conifold with, uh, with the not conormal brain. So that means that you can think of the quiver as describing the dynamics either of M2 brains with linking boundaries in LK or the dynamics of BPS vortices of T of LK. So let me start from the vortex picture to, uh, to understand what it means, uh, we have to, first of all, find a suitable description of what T of LK is. And to do that, we can resort to a general uh, fact coming from the 3D, 3D correspondence, which is that the partition function of vortices of T of LK should be uh, essentially the same as the partition function of a trans theory on the brain. But that, that is what we computed previously in the semi-classical limit. And once you have this partition function, you can uh, read off piece by piece uh, what are the components of T of LK. For instance, the integral would signal the presence of a U1 gauge symmetry. Log X log Y would be a Fayet-Leopoulos term for that gauge field. And every logarithm inside the uh, source potential would signal the presence of a Carroll multiple with certain charge and mass. The problem with this is that it's not very useful because W tilde, as I remarked before, is, is a very complicated function. It's often infinite, and it's hard to read off um, a sensible description in terms of gauge theory. However, we can again resort to the correspondence with quivers. We have a dual description for the same vortex partition function in terms of the quiver representation theory. We just take the semi-classical limit of that, we already know that this time the source potential looks very nice. And what this tells us from the viewpoint of 3D n equal two theory is that there's a, what we call T of Q. This is a theory um, associated with this partition function. The gauge group is a billion. It's a product of U1s, uh, one U1 factor for each node in the quiver. The matter content is a Carroll multiplet charged under each U1 and neutral under everybody else. And the only way that these sectors talk to each other is through uh, a matrix of mixture and Simons couplings. And this is precisely the quiver matrix. And then finally, the uh, Fayet-Leopoulos couplings for the various U1s in this case are the parameters that encode uh, the specialization of variables uh, in the non-quiver correspondence. So, to be fair, this description arises from the semi-classical limit, so you may wonder whether it is complete, whether it includes all the information that goes into the quantum story. And to do that, you can take this as a definition, you can compute the partition function of this 3D n equal two theory using localization, and then uh, one can check that indeed this coincides 
with the quiver partition function. So everything is there. And uh, we claim that this theory is the theory that uh, computes um, the partition function of quiver representation theory and therefore the partition function of not invariance. And so we come to the conclusion that uh, the origins of the quiver dynamics can be traced back to uh, a quantum mechanics for the BPS vortices in a theory, T of Q, whose description we're able to give quite explicitly. And it's interesting to note that uh, a couple of years ago, Wang Yi and Yoshida also observed that in certain 3D and equal two theories, the vortex spectrum does admit a quiver description. So there's a set of basic vortices, a finite set, and the rest of the spectrum is generated by quiver quantum mechanics where these basic vortices uh, play the role of, um, of nodes. So the class of theories that Wang Yi and Yoshida studied is actually uh, a bit different from uh, theories T of Q, but there is an overlap between the two, and for those uh, in the overlap, we checked that the two descriptions are consistent. Now, what about the viewpoint uh, of M2 brains for the quiver dynamics? Well, so in this story, every node of the quiver would be an M2 wrapping a basic holomorphic disk. Links in the quiver would be by fundamental light modes arising at the intersections of M2 brains. But this raises the question of how do you think about intersections of two cycles in a six manifold? And an answer to this question comes from uh, some technology um, known as not contact homology. The idea is that to a disk, you can associate um, another surface called the standardization of the disk. And this arises by, um, first of all, choosing a Morse function on the not conormal. This Morse function has a minimum uh, that lies on the zero section of LK. And at this minimum, we can take the fiber. It's a distinguished disk, which we call D0. Then, given a holomorphic curve, beta, with a boundary in LK, we define uh, a surface, sigma prime, as the union of the gradient flow lines of the Morse function starting from the boundary of beta. So these flow lines uh, start at the boundary, they live inside the not conormal, they go off to infinity, and they intersect the torus, the torus boundary, along the one cycle with m units of longitude and n units of meridian. Then the standardization procedure is to define a new surface that uh, is given by this one, where you subtract n copies of the reference disk so that basically you kill all meridian winding and you're left with something that only wraps around the longitude. So that's, that's a definition. But then uh, it was shown by these authors that uh, you can use this definition to define a linking number for, uh, for basic disks where the linking number of this chi and j is just the intersection number of the boundary of this chi with the standardization of this j. And this definition is well posed and symmetric, crucially. Now, that's not enough yet. You, you also have loops in the quiver, so you need to make se sense of self-linking. And to do that, you have to push this a little bit further and introduce uh, a forechain this is defined, again, using the gradient flow of the Morse function. You now take the imaginary counterpart. So this flows outside of the not conormal and into the conifold. And then for each disk, you choose a vector field, uh, a push-off field along the boundary. And then the self-linking is defined, well, it can be defined as the intersection of the push-off of the boundary of a disk with the standardization of the same corrected by intersection of the disk with the four chain. Again, one has to be careful here and show that things are well defined, that they do not depend on the Morse function and on the push of vector field, but um, this was uh, done by Eckholm and NG. And so uh, this technology can be used to make sense of linking numbers that appear in the quiver, um, in the quiver uh, matrix.
So given this linking number uh, description, we can finally try to address the question, to what extent is the correspondence one-to-one? -one? So is there a unique quiver for each knot? And one way to uh, address this question is to think about framing. So framing uh, is, uh, is an operation, well, is, uh, is a choice that affects both uh, not polynomials and the string partition function. And in knot theory, it arises from some uh, point splitting regularization of the path integral when you compute expectation values of Wilson lines and in topological strings, it arises as a sort of semi-classical ambiguity for what you mean by the longitude. But to be concrete, the effects of framing uh, can essentially uh, be described. So they boil down to um, shifts of x of the longitude allonomy by some units of the meridian. So if you make a change of framing, say in the augmentation variety, you just shift x to x times y to the f for some integer f. Now, if you think about what this does to the spectrum of BPS states, this is quite brutal. Because, for example, the Gromov witness potential uh, is computed by this Abel Jacobi map where y star is the solution of y uh, as a function of x coming from this equation. But you see that if you change the degree in y, then uh, log y star changes quite dramatically, and therefore LMO of invariance can change a lot. In some choice of framing, you may have a finite number of BPS states. In just a different choice, you may have infinitely many. So what happens on the quiver side? Since x and y have the interpretation of uh, longitude and meridian, respectively, on the boundary torus, then you can see that a change of framing is essentially a bent twist on the torus boundary of the not conormal. So that tells you that you should expect that there's an overall shift of the linking numbers of the basic sources uh, by f. That's a very simple prediction that uh, comes out of our picture. There's no change in the not quiver change of variables. And in fact, this perfectly matches and explains uh, previous observations uh, in the original paper on the not quiver correspondence. And it also implies indeed that the quiver is not unique, that there's a different quiver, at least for each choice of framing. It's also interesting to note that this uh, shift in the linking matrix uh, from the viewpoint of 3D n equal 2 physics uh, on T of Q, this is a sh an overall shift of Chern Simons couplings. And, uh, well, if, uh, if you're familiar with this work of Witten, this is the, this is the T action on, uh, on abelian gauge theories uh, in three dimensions with, with Chern Simons couplings. Okay, so let me summarize. Uh, so, what we find is that the quiver description of not invariants can be traced back to the dynamics of BPS vortices in certain 3D and equal two theories, uh, which we call T of Q and coded by the quiver. And we find a very explicit description of these theories. There's a U1 gauge group for each node in the quiver. For each of these U1s, there's a charge chiral multiplet that is neutral under everybody else. And the quiver matrix has the interpretation of churn simons couplings uh, mixture and Simon's couplings among these different gauge groups. And then finally, the not quiver change of variables uh, arises as uh, some a specialization of the Fayediopoulos terms uh, for these different U1s. From the mathematical viewpoint, what we learned is that, first of all, augmentation polynomials of knots uh, seem to admit a decomposition into universal building blocks. So some very simple polynomials taking a universal form, the, what we call the quiver A polynomials. And uh, we also learned that uh, the spectrum of holomorphic curves uh, on the conifold in presence of uh, LK uh, is, uh, is encoded just by a finite set of basic holomorphic disks. There's one for each node, and their interactions are encoded by how their boundaries are linking in a suitable sense inside the conormal. And then through quiver quantum mechanics, this finite set of basic disk generates everybody else, including higher genius curves. And last but not least, we 
do find uh, through this uh, chain of dualities, we're able to write down a fairly detailed dictionary between the geometric and physical objects that appear in the not quiver correspondence. And we believe that there is much more to do now using this dictionary uh, in extracting interesting consequences both on the mathematical and the physical uh, side um, through, this, uh, through this knowledge. So I guess I'll stop here. Thank you very much. So are there any questions? Hey, so you've, um, you've shown a really beautiful match between structures on the topological string side and this, this not quiver correspondence. Um, I didn't quite get whether you were at the point where you could take a knot um, in the conifold and extract a quiver directly from the geometry. Is there, or if not, is that, is that where this is going? Well, yeah, that, that's the dream. Uh, we, we're not there in the sense that, I mean, just from the knot diagram, it's still not possible at this point. Uh, but we did improve the situation in the following sense. So in the original knot quiver correspondence, the way that um, the quiver was derived was to take the generating series of color helpful PT polynomials. So you needed information about finite Q. Now, what we've learned is that you don't really need information about um, higher genus curves. Somehow everything is encoded by basic holomorphic disks. What that means in practice is that if you just give me the augmentation variety that only knows about the holomorphic disks, we should be able, and in many examples we, we can do, we can get the quiver out of that with a bit of work. So, yeah, I mean, this can be done. I don't want to get into details, but uh, that, that is where we are so far. So we, we made this step. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Are there other questions? Oh. So can you try to interpret the cohomological whole algebra on the quiver side and on the, on the note, note theory side? Is it... The, it's a beautiful question, yeah. Um, so indeed, in work of Efimov, he works out the cohomological whole algebra for these symmetric quivers, so that's, that's known. In principle, one can uh, think about that, and we haven't, we haven't really tried. Uh, worth of mention, although I'm not sure this is the right direction, worth of mention is that there is an algebra on, on the side of not contact homology as well. This is an homology of some differential graded algebra of, well, certain rib chords where the differential is defined by certain holomorphic disks. So there may be some relation, but uh, yeah, it's, a, it's very interesting, but we haven't really thought about it. Are there any more questions? Did they um, no, I'm asking, did they finish setting up coffee? I didn't want to know what to send. Okay. Yeah, the, I don't think they're ready yet. Well, let's thank uh, Pietro again. <laughs>